Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, super excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Samer Bishay, CEO and co-founder of Carrier One. Uh, we're here at the COP28 event um, hosted at the Capital Club and in collaboration with uh, MCH uh, Global. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the father of crypto, the authority on blockchain, and the legend, uh, David. Um, and uh, we have uh, Christina as well from uh, uh, Cointelegraph. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I came in all the way from Canada, actually. This is like one of the main events that I want to listen to because I'm going to be taking a lot of notes about what David and Christina have to talk about today. So super excited to be here. Welcome. Come on in, David, Christina. Thank you so much, Summer. Thank you for such a um, energetic introduction. I'm also super honored and pleased. I came here not from Canada, but from Italy. Um, and I'm incredibly excited because I've been working in the crypto and blockchain space for the last seven years, um, leading the editorial of the oldest, largest publication dedicated to blockchain advocates. And David Chow was, was one of the greatest inspirations for us because this person um, has dedicated his life to computer science, to uh, privacy-focused solutions, in 82, he wrote his dissertation um, on blockchain, 82. There were all but one elements of blockchain, right, David? That's correct. And yeah, he's called father of online anonymity, godfather of cryptocurrency, and I'm pretty sure that he will become other important parent <laughs> to something <laughs> that will have a great impact. Um, so there is so much actually about you, uh, a lot of different projects, digital yes. cash, um, something that you're working right now on. I would love to start with, with a personal question. Sure, what no is problem. that you are most proud of out of all these great achievements? Or maybe I haven't even mentioned it. <laughs> well, to be really frank, and it's maybe a little bit uh, out of this, the, the realm here, but I did make a very fundamental scientific breakthrough uh, called multi-party computation. And it's a kind of thrill that you only get if you're really at the, like a world-class leading edge science just that stumbles on something that's really big. And so that was uh, uh, awesome, and I've received uh, this award for the best and most enduring paper of the last 30 years in theoretical computer science. Now, when you dissect that, theoretical computer science hasn't really existed for much more than 30 years, and it's the first time they gave it, and it is a big deal, and it turns out that when I created this, it, it was kind of theoretical, very satisfying, because you know it, it, it fully characterized what you can do with information security, but it's now might really turn out to be the way to kind of uh, tame artificial intelligences so that they can uh, kind of duke it out so we don't have to have uh, warfare or uh, conflict in the, in the physical world. So this is, uh, you know, it, I think it's, I'm pretty proud of that and uh, yeah, so, uh, and honestly, this, you know, if when I look at, uh, you know, barter, which existed for thousands of years, and then we've had a couple kinds of, you know, commodity and, uh, and fiat money, I think this better than money thing is a big step up from both and does what they did way better. So I, I'm, I'm just shocked to have run into something so profoundly better and, and, and easy to deploy, and I think its time has really uh, come, so I, I think I'm very proud of that too. We'll talk about it in a second. Oh, sure, no problem, I don't want to rush um, to that, I just... Because there is actually a lot about a lot of stuff we like to talk about of. in the meantime, yeah. Uh, oh but gosh. Th this has been a revelation mm -hmm. for me, well not a revelation, actually, it hasn't been a revelation for me because you highlighted scientific things. So do you consider yourself a scientist in the first place? Yes, actually, I do. <laughs> yeah. 
ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, Sorry. I think this brings me to a very um, important social aspect that, in my personal opinion, we still have a long way uh, before the scientific circles, the academic circles, are integrated uh, adequately okay. with the, the business interests in the world. Yes. Um, can you elaborate a well, little bit on Well, let me just give you a experience? concrete example, and this is not a planned uh, thing, but I mean, Edward Snowden kind of shocked the planet, right? He said, you know, the government's been spying on everybody like, like you couldn't believe. Like they intercepted your equipment before it got to your place. They had deals with all the big, you know, uh, 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 social, uh, Google and everyone to spy on everything you were doing. And I think the world was, was pretty stunned by that. And I had founded this have fun of the International Association for Cryptologic Research, you know, to set cryptography free. This was about in 82, and, you know, I risked spending my life in jail to have a conference on cryptography because this was banned at that time. Um, so I was at, you know, it's a very successful organization that I created. We have enough money to run the conferences for a year. We have three conferences a year and six workshops, roughly, uh, so we have enough money in the bank to run for a whole year even if no one comes to our conferences. And we're not affiliated with, we're an independent entity. So this is very unusual in the scientific community because I felt it's really important. The members can vote on things to, you know, to create the uh, uh, position of the association. So I felt it was very uh, worth creating that. And by creating it, I set cryptography free because it became an international scientific association that the U.S. government really couldn't stop because it's, that kind of thing is supported by the United Nations. Okay, but so anyway, so I'm attending the annual, uh, one of the three annual uh, conferences, the, what was actually the main one. Uh, it was just a couple months after the Snowden revelations, and we had about six, 700 people there, maybe, uh, something like that, and um, you know, a lot of them I know, or they know me, and, uh, and the most of them are academics, and, and um, you know, Oddly, they all felt that, of course, I would, wouldn't be surprised that I've always known the government was spying on everybody. But actually, I remained neutral on that. I, I was shocked by this. I, I didn't know. And, uh, but they thought if anyone, you know, I would be the one. Do and not then, scientists spy on each other? Pardon me? They Do spy on each other? Yeah, they knew that. No, no, I've been a victim of that. It's also... You know, they, what is the, you know the, 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 the conflicts in the scientific community are far... Uh, more vicious and bitter than anywhere else because there's so little to fight about. You know, that's the, the famous, uh, I think that's, no, maybe it's a Kissinger quote, but um, who's now deceased, I'm sorry to have to, but uh, recently, uh, but in any event, just to, 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 um, to get to the punchline here, you know, I was sickened and disgusted because Really, there wasn't anyone among those people, and I've started interviewing people, that was really concerned about this. They're all there, happy, you know, with their publications and trying to add new things to their list. You know, I, I've talked to people at universities, like, say, well, I've got this really great new interesting thing, and they're like, well, can I get grant money for it? Can I hire more students, or can I get the dean to like me? Those are the only three things that I care about, you know, and I'm like, well, no, this is like for science. Well, that's, you know, not really the thing. So I, I'm very diff much disheartened by academia. On the other hand, if, if, you know, liberal thinking hadn't created the notion of the university, I mean, I, I can't imagine how, where the world would be. So even the little bit of real academia that we have has been so helpful. Um, yeah, so anyways, there's a true life story uh, maybe the first time I mentioned it, yeah. So every love story is a story of a balance, exactly. right? Exactly. Balancing between uh, different forces uh, and between different concepts that are sort of uh, opposing forces, right? Uh, so you've mentioned privacy. Yes. Uh, obviously, there is this famous triangle dilemma, right, with the privacy, security, and scalability yeah. uh, being three... Uh, yeah. Three points that are impossible to develop at the same time, and at the same time, yeah. very important to develop them at That's the right. same time. That's right. This is uh, 
but you know, Vitalik uh, proposed this trilemma some time ago. Vitalik it's it's Vitalik. totally wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. But uh, you know, so uh, but uh, you know, it's easy to for a journalist to pump out a lot of information, but you know, and diagrams and so on. But you got to takes a real scientist to know what's what's really possible and so what not. So now we're having something against journalists. No, no. <laughs> I'm just saying that the journalists who, public, who pretend to be scientists, that's, they have an unfair advantage because they're able to really pump out a lot of uh, you know, interesting articles. But that doesn't mean there's a real scientific basis. You can use the key words. I keep running into it. So is it but, is the uh, question of privacy no, but, well, for you a scientific one or a social well, one? Well, so let me say that in the late 1970s, I realized how fundamentally important privacy would be in the upcoming digital world. This is 77 to 79. And I noticed what the governments had been doing as far as trying to spy on people by listening to who talks to whom and when. And I realized that this metadata was really the big uh, issue and that if you couldn't solve that privacy problem, that we would lose individual autonomy and sovereignty in the upcoming information age, and computers would basically take over. And now we're feeling it, you know, with AI and everything. And so, you know, it 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 it, it uh, accentuates and, and puts in, you know, stark relief or whatever metaphor, you know you want to say, it, however you want to say it. It's highlighting the uh, severity of this, you know. In, choice point we're at. Either, either you know, they're going to help us make a more human civilization or we're going to help them eradicate us or put us, you know, into some much less uh, uh, creative uh, role. And so the key determinant is whether they can really know everything about us or not. Because information is power, and privacy is the only way, you know, to protect your information from, from the the informational uh, mechanisms of society. And cryptography is the only way to give that protection teeth. You know, you can ask people to protect to honor your the, the secrecy and confidentiality of information about yourself, but. You know, even little kids know that that's not always that safe a, a thing because you never know whether, when, if they betrayed it and so on. So with information, you really you have to keep it secret. Otherwise, you have to assume that it's, it's going to get misused. And so cryptography is the only way to save civilization. That's what it boils down to. And that's my, you know, hero's quest, if you want to think of it that way. But I mean... It, it wasn't, it's not really like I'm doing it to try to, you know, be a hero. I'm, it's unfortunately the case that I recognized this quite early on, and I felt that it, you know, I had to do this. So I've been trying to do it my whole uh, professional career. Well, I think actually children maybe are smarter than, uh, like, the majority of adults just because we are too used to, uh, to the status quo. And scientists, in my opinion are the ones who manage to be eternal children and like to get well, surprised with the... Right. In terms of technology, I think it's very important also uh, here we are at COP and uh, um, I've, I've heard a lot of talks about transparency of data mm. and this is incredibly um, inspiring how we can use blockchain for uh, not disclosing everything while keeping track of everything. Like zero knowledge yeah. proof technology yes. that is... Uh, um, something, in my opinion, also very revolutionary. So privacy is important. Decentralization is important. Why you think it can change the world, why it can change the world now, and why this better of... Uh, we need something that is better than money. Well, yeah, so what, I, what I'm really uh, saying is not that we need it now so much as... I mean, to, to change the world, I think what we need to do is, is preserve the, the kind of world that humanity has lived in for the vast majority of its existence, right? 
where there is an expectation of privacy because if you talk to someone somewhere out in the, you know, in the forest or jungle or whatever at the beach, no one else can know what you're saying. And so that, that, that there is, uh, we just have to kind of preserve that aspect of, of uh, human experience uh, in this, you know, information technology rich world, which is, you know, very hungry for information. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, Tell us more about better than money. <laughs> okay, well, but let's fast forward to, I mean, right now, central banks around the world have positioned themselves at the ready to issue central bank digital currency, you know, like retail to the, to the consumers. This would be central bank money that consumers could have uh, access to and use digitally. And um, this is a, you know, they've admitted it's a, it's a kind of defensive, protective stance to uh, respond to the Facebook initiative and all the various successes that have we've seen in the, in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space and so on. And it makes perfect sense. Uh, uh, however, it, it turns out, and this is an extremely radical thing for me to be saying here at the Capital Club, if you think about the you know, excruciating irony of it, money is not the thing. Money is a, is a screw deal for the poor, if I want to, you know, put it succinctly, excuse the uh, coarse language, and really it's a bad deal for, for us rich guys too, because what it's doing is keeping the poor poor because they have no way to accumulate wealth and no way to, um, you know, uh, um, protect themselves against like inflation and their value is being invested by others for the benefit of others instead of for their own benefit. Um, so, and, and they're being ex kept out of the global economy. Uh, and this is, you know, it's, in, it's inhibiting the development of the global economy. So we're, the rich people are actually kind of screwing themselves partly by keeping the poor people down uh, through money, and so what, what actually is needed is money, just like the idea that blockchain is the only way to do this decentralization, the idea that money is the only way to deal with value is, is misleading. And so what you really need is simply a universal medium of exchange. That's all anyone really needs. And of course, just like a big corporation, you don't want to hold someone else's debt just so that you can participate in a medium of exchange. What you'd much rather do is hold the assets that you uh, need, want to hold that are beneficial to you to hold, uh, like investments and hedges and this and that, and then be able to draw from them directly as a medium of exchange into the asset portfolio of your counterparty with privacy in both directions and against, say, surveillance of, of the state or other actors. That's what, that's what you really want. And money isn't really what you want. <laughs> it's not really good for anyone. And, you know, let's put it a bit differently. Um, Money was a natural, develop, a fantastic development for, for civilization, right? For huge improvement over barter, right? Because now, you know, you could, so everyone knows this, and it's evolved a little bit, but it, it essentially is something that, whose technology is rooted in, in paper or metal. And so with paper or metal technology, you can make money, and you can run countries and, you know, create... Tremendous economic growth, like we've seen it, uh, but but there's something that's actually considerably better, which would let all value be uh, invested and in, and in, you know I, I can talk about the benefits of better than money. You know, avoid the global liquidity crisis. How many people here are worried about the global liquidity crisis? 
you know, if you go to the, the metro station, it might not be that. But if people who know what's going on uh, realize that, you know, Silicon Valley Bank and, you know, GameStop, you know, these are, uh, this is, you know, signs that, that it's a very fragile uh, reality that, that we're living in here. Uh, and so Better Than Money solves that. It's all asset backed, right? So it solves that. It, it, and how many people spend time worrying that certain, you know, that popular, popularism and, you know, these, these kind of uh, strong men leaders emerging around the world and it seems like even it might happen in major countries and it's, uh, it's pretty disturbing. And I, I, all my family gatherings are focused on this kind of thing. It's, a, it's you know, it's very much in the air and, you know, I attribute that to a very simple analysis that the... The, the, the poor either feel like they're in the midst of gaining prosperity for themselves, they're in a rising uh, uh, sea of prosperity, in which case they vigorously defend capitalism, and we've seen that in the last century. When the U.S. said we need everyone to come out and fight, you know, they just showed up, I think, on the same day. There was like almost everyone showed up, whereas... If you, if you look at what's happening today, even 20, 30% of American youth, I read, uh, you know, they, want to, they, they, they believe the system's not working for them economically. They don't see rising prosperity for them as a possibility. And so they just think, it's not working for me. I'm just going to give, I'm just going to vote for some extreme thing. I don't even I don't really understand what it is. But, you know, the system's not working. Look at Italy in the 1930s. Uh, the system was not working for people. Democracy was not working for the common person in Italy, and they voted in uh, Mussolini, uh, you know, and then look, look at Germany. It's the same thing happened. So, you know, I, it's not, if you just look at it from an economic point of view, which I think is appropriate here, it's, it's actually sort of rational that if you don't, if the system's not working for you, you might just offer something else, right? But if it is, you're going to defend it. So, what better than money does is it lets everyone on the planet participate in the growing prosperity, and in particular for themselves. And, uh, and it has, you know, these additional benefits that it avoids the global liquidity crisis, right? And it also you know, helps markets because you get more information. You know, a lot of trading is on a very thin pricing information. You may not know this, but it, it's, it's quite stunning if you actually look. So having kind of crowdsourced pricing information will be tremendously beneficial for markets and to also make business more responsive to social uh, issues. So I think it's a, a super good thing. Uh, and according to Condorcet's theorem, if you're into that kind of thing, you know, we'll get much better information from, from a lot of uh, uh, suppliers of information. So uh, it's, it, it's, and if you look at, for instance, um, you know, IMF, for decades they've done their loans in, you know, the so-called special drawing rights basket of five currencies, because that's the best way to do loans. There's no question. If you're, depending which side of the loan you're on, you're looking, you know, you don't want to do it in a single currency because you're afraid it might go up or down and you might, you know, be at the, at the short end of that. So you're much more willing to do loans or any kind of future payment if it's denominated in a mutually agreed basket. Well, with better than money, that becomes trivial. Right now, even the World Bank does not use I, uh, SDR because it's just too complicated to administer and whatever. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. But with, with better than money, you know, you could use it to uh, pay your utility bill, you know, to, uh, for any kind of future payments for, the, uh, you know, it could be used for supply chain uh, and all kinds of, um, you know, derivatives and so on. So it's, it's, it's fundamentally better for economic activity. Uh, and so it will encourage. So we're talking about, yeah, it's, it's just that we've, we've, We've grown up with a, with, a, with a love of this primitive instrument, money, because 
it was inconceivable that there could be anything else really. It seemed like a miracle that it was the universal medium of exchange. And you know, believe me, it was more universal like a decade ago than it is now, right? There's already moves afoot to uh, you know, uh, ununiversalize it, as you know, and weaponize it, and there's a lot of energy around that. And also, in the blockchain space, you've seen uh, a movement in that direction. Uh, efforts to sort of tokenize all kinds of assets. Well, these are all sort of clumsy precursor steps in the direction of better than money. So if, so if you look at what the financial system, you know, the Bank for International Settlement and central banks are doing, and many commercial banks, they're, 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 they built this, this CBDC technology for wholesale and retail and so forth. That's the perfect building block for better than money. So they, in their own defensive defense, have created the seeds of their own destruction. That's a perfect thing to build it out of. And I happen to own <laughs> the best EBDC technology that's out there. Uh, thank you, Bank for International Settlement, for proving that it can do all the transactions in Switzerland three times over in real time. That, was just, that report was just released last week, right? So uh, this is, uh, you know, these are... It, 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 just like a lot of great ideas or you know, things that are going you know, to really change things, we've been moving quietly in this, unknowingly in this direction, uh, you know, both on the, from the financial community and from the blockchain space um, and you know, just from the, general, uh, the political sphere. Uh, and now Better Than Money can kind of just bring this all together. And hopefully in time, we, it can you know, uh, enrich the world, and take the two and a half trillion dollar free cash flow revenue opportunity that payments is, right? That's paid disproportionately by the poor. The poorer you are, the more you pay for payments. That two and a half trillion dollars, according to McKinsey, of free cash flow is actually paying for something that you could a product that you could facilitate with about less than one thousandth of that amount of money. I mean, can you imagine a billion dollars worth of computers? Would you really need that to do better than money globally? No. So it's it you know all that money is just going up somebody's nose or something. It's it's not really going into you know it's not like a, like a regular. It's a regressive tax of the worst kind that is not. You know, it's really harming the global economy and disproportionately from where real growth occurs. And so, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a no-brainer. Let's. So, anyone who wants to help me make better than money real, I'm, I'm, I'm game. Let's let's do it. I've got a lot of interest. It just, I've been working for the last year uh, to realize this when I had this epiphany that you know what the world, what the poor really need is a better money. And I didn't, I didn't, I can't claim I saw it all clearly from, you know, uh, from, but, but through working hard to develop and refine the technology and presenting it in a lot of confidential meetings to, you know, the head of research for the Fed and all these economists and historians of money and all this stuff. And then now more publicly, uh, I've, it's, it's really started to crystallize and everyone seems uh, to love it and uh, it's yeah, it's 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 super exciting. So I'm 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 just thrilled to be able to uh, talk about it here. That's really amazing. And ladies and gentlemen, we've just uh, demonstrated you technology patented by David Chom and uh, Coin Telegraph. Uh, I was passing uh, mentally the questions to David, and he was answering them. <laughs> <laughs> um, whose commitments and which commitments are needed to move forward? such an ambitious uh, initiative as Better Than Money. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you believe in it, you are surrounded by people who believe in it, there always are a lot of skepticism. And, I've and not met them, but I hear you. That's a good, those are good, all good questions. Honestly, I've, I've just only received like, enthusiasm from people about it. I mean, what's not to like, really? No one's really looking forward to a global liquidity crisis except the people that have their own you know, jets and they want to you know, come back later and buy everything up cheap. But most people don't really relish the idea of, uh, you know, a, a, a global economic meltdown for no reason, because the current systems weren't designed to be robust against social media. In fact, it's as simple as that, right? 
you know, uh, main uh, legal comp. I try to do deals with all these guys. I mean, I've been in, you know, I've been in central banks all over the world. And uh, I was the first, just a funny story. Over here, if it's, I, I was at, speaking of Italy, a central bank conference in Rome where uh, they told me I was the first non-central banker they ever allowed in, and I was giving a keynote. And after my speech, they opened, it was like in an opera theater in the center of Rome, you know, the air perfumiano was clogged up with their private planes. Uh, they, op it was like a parting of the seas. They allowed us to cross through the river of, of, of Roman traffic uh, over like four blocks. He's made through the center of the block, these little alleys, and there we were uh, in the Vatican. And there wasn't anyone else, it was closed. It was only for us. So I was in the Sistine Chapel, for instance, and there was two, two guys in there, that, guys, but they were, uh, you know, one ahead of Venezuela, another, you know, was head of another central bank. <laughs> that was, you know, it was like, that shows you what's, uh, you know, what's really going on in this world. And, but anyway, so I, I'm fortunate for having invented electronic money in the first place. It was very widely, you know, uh, acclaimed. I sent the first electronic money payment from at the first World Wide Web conference from CERN to Amsterdam. Uh, there were only two keynotes, mine and Tim Berners-Lee. And mine was first. When you was You can it? see it. This was first World Wide Web conference. Was it 80? Well, I don't know, whatever it was, 84 was it? Anyways, uh, you can see I have clips, I have the whole video of my presentation. I, in those days, it was a big deal. They had these enormous projectors to protect the, you know, your low resolution uh, screen onto the screen that everyone could see it. Uh, because usually we used the plastic slides in those days. And the, so we, I actually pay, made this e-cash payment from uh, over that. And then, you know, it was issued by, uh, Deutsche Bank, so I had to meet with the Deutsche Bank board. They issued e-cash in Deutschmarks in those days, uh, and, uh, and so on. So, I mean, fortunately, I can leverage a little bit of this to, you know, get this message out, but that, I think that will help better the money, but the, I think the cause is much, you know, it's not, it's not about me, and it's not, there's no, I haven't even created a legal entity for it. I'm just trying, you know, I've been talking to a number of countries. There are countries that take this very, very seriously. Um, and uh, also major, you know, economic actors and, uh, and so on. So it's just, uh, there's a tremendous interest. So I was, worked so hard to develop these ideas. Uh, and, and I was so frustrated by only being able to present them in confidential meetings. It's so hard to arrange all that. Um, so I made it public a couple weeks ago in Singapore, Singapore Financial Festival, and uh, I hadn't really had a chance to think about how to deploy it, but now uh, people are coming to me, and it, it seems there's a, a number of avenues, and uh, that, that's, you know, that's, uh, that's great. But it's, it's, it's an idea whose time has come, and it's not really, I mean, it's revolutionary, but it's actually just sort of a continuation of trends well, we've seen. you've been keeping bringing this revolutionary things, like, well, we were talking about 84, so it's 40 years. Yeah. Uh, and I see that your, your eyes are shining when you talk about this. How, how, do, you, how do you keep this optimism? What, what is it that inspires you? Because the, the world, um, well, the world is pretty much the same, right? And it's, it's full of... Uh, balance between uh, good and evil. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, I guess, to, you know, thanks, Christine, for the, you know, personal, like, angle on this. I guess, yeah, I do think of myself as a scientist, but, you know, people often ask me, like, well, what do you do in your spare time, David, you know? Um, one of the things I like to do is just kind of, uh, you know, ideate and kind of, you know, uh, they have... Uh, lucid dreaming, people talk about or whatever, really think deeply about things. This is, uh, is, a, is fun for me, and I try to make time every day to do that. And what, I try to gently bring my thoughts back to uh, during that is, you know, what would be the most important thing you could do to make the world a better place? Because I'm only one ten billionth of the, you know, pretty much, of, you know, I think it's, if you look at it, like, I think it's several kilos of uh, sand. 
beach sand. That you're just one grain in that. You know, it's uh, it's quite humbling. And so yeah, I just try to really go for that. And that so that's it went just like when I've you know some major scientific discovery when you can find a way to do something that's uh, really good and it's doable. That's it's uh, it's a huge thrill. If that's your this orientation. This is super interesting. Can we? I, these are maybe sure. obvious for you, but you have this mind. I, like we are here mostly business people, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think it's it, it would be really very interesting to know how you structure your thoughts, because in business you always have well sort of a goal, right? A KPI and mm. uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm simplifying, but like yeah. this is what pushes your actions. Well, and there's a single this metric is what as well. Your plan. Money, right? Exactly. This is, well. Single figure of merit makes the, the life the of the business important. person. Uh, so, how yeah, do you structure tractable. your? Because I imagine that there are so much, so ma so much going on in your head. How do you structure it into concrete um, conclusions and concrete achievements? Because it's also in the end, it's it's a, it's an internal process, right? Like yeah. everything is connected. What you've been doing. Yeah, it, it, that's part of the challenge is really to keep kind of focusing and driving towards things which are instantiatable. Uh, but you, maybe you've read, you know, that if you work on technical stuff for, what is it, 20,000 hours or something, you get good at it. There's books that say that, right? It's, it, it, it turns out that, you know, the major famous scientists are way ahead of the pack generally for their whole main career. Uh, and this is, you know, creates tremendous frustration for those aspiring scientists. But uh, you can read, you know, Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, you know. It all seems sort of unfair, but there's an aspect to it which is, you know, related to having worked on a certain kind of problem for a long time. You, you learn, the way I think of it is you learn, like, all the things that are really hard to do and that maybe can't be done, and so you avoid those, and then you, uh, you know, but if you see a solution to one of those, you know that's valuable, so you kind of go towards that, and then if, and then there's tricks that you have and you know. So like in business, I mean, if you're in real estate, you, you probably have a set of ideas and skills like this, it lets you, you know, find the perfect things to do, right, or really good things to do. Uh, so in science, that accumulates, and it's 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 even better than in, I think in real estate because you know some of these ideas that you have and like the little we say theorems you prove or the little arguments you make convince yourself of or the I, those aren't public, so you're accumulating you know secret weapons, special secret sauce and knowledge and and. I don't want to take this too far, but also, you, you know, in design, they speak about design languages. Perhaps you've, you've run into that. Well, yeah, in science, you, the language that you use to think about ideas is uh, very helpful to moving them forward, and it's your own private language usually. I mean, you might share it with your graduate students, but it's, it doesn't appear. Scientific papers, it's just like the conference I was mentioning, they, you know, they're deliberately written to be very hard for other people to understand, right, and look very impressive. Thank and, you for admitting that. Right? Well, you know, this and, uh, uh, but, it, you know, so, it, but if you're trying to change the world, like I have been, you know, you, you really go out of your way to try to make your work understandable to others. And that's why I you know, put a substantial effort. How do you effort. manage your success and uh, manage? How do you measure your success and how do you measure your, your own satisfaction with uh, your thoughts and your scientific uh, activity? Well, I think that being judgmental is not really conducive to a creative process. So I, I don't really, <laughs> I'm not very critical of myself. I just keep going. Trying to do the best I can, I guess so. I, I, yeah, but I'm I'm stunned by the better the money. I mean, why me? Why would I have to figure this out? All these economists, all this stuff going on, and I just you know, it's like fish and water, right? But you, you know, you, in when you're doing basic science, the things you find were already there before you were you got there, so you you really can't take credit for them. 
you know, if you could take credit for your effort to find them or the fact that you, you know, have directed yourself towards these things of significance. But the ideas themselves, they were there already. So, uh, you, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't really, I wouldn't want to judge uh, myself by the quality of the things that I've achieved because I think it, it, they're things I've discovered. So actually constant thinking uh, out of the box. I think this is important. Yes. Just to give a context, let's uh, maybe talk a little bit about other um, crazily ambitious ideas that you're working on. <laughs> Just well, I'm not going to avoid the, that characterization, but uh, since we're at COP28, uh, uh, you know, we do have uh, the AstroCool project, and it's a very simple idea that I had, which was to move, but it took, I worked on it really hard. So that's the thing, you know, people think of these, you know, popular heroes, they just come out and, and sing these amazing, you know, things, but they, they, they work, they have to work really hard. Someone's working really hard to create all this stuff. I would work really hard uh, to create this, but it, it's a simple idea now. Uh, but it has evolved considerably. Uh, basically, you can simply move moon dust. You know, the moon is covered in five to 15 meters of dust, the whole moon. It's a very fine powder because of, it's being pummeled by you know, asteroids for billions of years. And you can move that dust to the, what's called the Sun-Earth L1 point, which is the gravity balance between the sun, which is massive, and the, you know, the Earth is tiny. So it's about 1% of the way uh, to the sun from the Earth, and it, it, it so as the Earth goes around the sun and the Earth's you know orbits and the Moon is involved a little bit, uh, that point always stays blocking sunlight that would hit the Earth. And so we've that uh, was my idea to move the Moon dust there, and it turns out that other scientists have thought of related things about building mirrors and stuff there. So it turns out you it's actually feasible to uh, to to cool to bring the Earth to pre-industrial. Uh, temperatures to reduce the average temperature of the Earth by two degrees centigrade by moving. It's a lot of moon dust, but it's it's not as McKinsey said. Oh, it's going to take ten trillion dollars a year to you know maybe make it down in all this. No, we can go back to pre-industrial temperatures from way under ten trillion dollars, and and probably uh, we can make a profit doing it because if you sift through all that moon dust to to launch it over to the L1, uh, you're going to find some interesting stuff in there that with the same technology, you can also send it back to Earth and then you can kind of let it waft its way back down uh, with these existing technologies. So you can deliver these, whatever, you know, precious metals, the isotopes, things people are interested in. Even if just there's water in moon dust, there's a certain moisture level and water on the moon is extremely valuable if you want to make conventional rocket fuels, you know, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, but you can also use it, you know, to get oxygen for people and, and stuff. So it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of valuable stuff in it, so uh, we have to sift it. So it's a, it's a, it, you know, it's very consistent with the so-called cis-lunar economy that, you know, some of the biggest nations are involved in this kind of, let's kind of get out of the business of funding space research and let's private industry figure out a way to make money between like the earth and the moon and stay up there and do stuff. Well, this is the perfect thing for that. So we're able to do that. Um, another thing is uh, Project Zanzibar, which was, uh, you know, came up. this is a um, uh, technology that, it's a privacy technology that takes fingerprints or retina scans and allows them to be stay encrypted all the time from the moment of capture and be controlled completely by consensus on a blockchain. So there's billions of people on the planet who've given their fingerprints and eye scans and stuff to computers, and it's just a matter of time before that stuff leaks out, unfortunately. And if it does, those biometrics will never be able to be used again for anything. This is a destruction of the commons, and. You know, and uh, so with this technology, the Zanzibar technology solves it, and uh, we're we have this, it's, it's figured out. We're just gonna we've got a an op-ed that explains it, uh, to, you know, pretty simply, and uh, so that's 
look, look, you know, watch this space for that. And um, there's, uh, uh, you know, so with this so-called um, U factor, uh, which is a, a different kind of identity technology, which is that you can prove with sort of zero knowledge, is something I had a lot to do with, by the way. But that is, you can prove that you know the private key, and you can easily reconstruct the private key that corresponds to a particular public key. And if you know, if you know, if you know about this domain, uh, that's really interesting because it means that any message that's sent encrypted with that public key, you'll always be able to decode it. And so even if someone wants to pay you for a vote, you can always secretly cancel that vote because you have that secret information. Or someone wants to steal your money and use the privacy that was afforded to you for their own evil purposes, you can always allow that money to be traced. So it's kind of an interesting thing about, you know, empowering the individual actually helps uh, create, a, uh, a, a, you know, the kind of uh, free societies that, that we would like. Um, and that we've talked about some of the AI stuff, the multi-party computation, and uh, so there's, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, there's a little book, maybe uh, you've, some of you might have heard about it. Maybe it will come out someday. Right now it's just circulating among the... Uh, it's anonymous, but, <laughs> but when you read, you recognize... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's, I have like a vision for the future where the, where the public basically demonstrates through another technology, which is called the Seventh Estate, which we've demonstrated now a couple of times. As a, it's a way to do a public opinion survey that's provably un, untamperable. So you can prove that a majority of the, the, the population supports a specific proposition. You can use that to back the AstroCool going forward once it's sort of demonstrated, which is its current phase, it looks like it's sponsored by the German government now to do it, prove that it can basically work. And then um, what that will do is kind of en engender a um, coming together of uh, the people on the planet really feel that they have the power to make the world a better place and make, you know, as a, I think we can make the earth great again. You know, I think these people are telling us we got to get out of here and, you know, that's wrong. I can't imagine making another place any better than here. We can make the earth like as beautiful as it was you know, <laughs> before I was born. You know, that would be really fabulous. If we have people, if we can all enjoy and prosper here, that's, that's a really uh, great goal, I think. And we could do that if we pull together and say, look, this is our planet. We don't want it to be wrecked, and uh, we want to cool it in a way that doesn't, you know, uh, involve uh, making the poor more poor and, you know, all these other things, and just, you know, just put some sunshades up there and cool it down and, you know, until we figure out how to, you know, not, not, not pollute as much and, and so forth and so on. So uh, that's, that's uh, those are some of the things I, I've been working on. Some of the things. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm genuinely infatuated, and I think you're being humble. It's not only about making the earth great again, but also making the humanity great again. Yes. What, what David just mentioned, that is like one of my favorite part of the books, is it's actually the revised uh, version of democracy. So, yeah. With a, a different approach to voting. Uh, I think that we all feel here that this incredible mind has so much insight. So I think before we move toward, um, I will open the floor to your questions. My last one is in simple things that inspire you and keep inspiring you to, to, to keep being curious uh, mm. and to keep searching inside of your mind for the solutions and for the new problems that, that can be solved with the solutions. Small tips, like what is it that uh, inspires you when you are sleepy and you wakes you up? What does give you energy when you are tired? Um, what does give you hope when you are uh, in doubts? Um, is it... Well, I, I don't want to... Uh, provide alternatives, what is it, like small things in, within your usual day? 
or unusual day? Well, you know, I think most people have a craving to understand the world around them and how it works. And these days, it's, it's you know, it's a pretty uh, daunting, uh, challenging uh, project uh, because of oh, misinformation and the complexity of, of things and just even trying to understand, you know, another person or, you know, uh, and so forth and so on. But... Um, I think when you, for me, is, uh, you, you're constantly involved in this struggle and picking up little clues and you find out about how things work, you know, in an inner sanctum and, a, you know, a, a various, uh, uh, you know, centers of power and this and that, um, that, that, uh, it, it's very inspiring uh, when you when you know you get a little glimmer of of maybe seeing through and and what's really you know behind things and driving things and how the the things really work and, and it's it's you know those little uh, leakages of of what's really behind things I think is are the little inspiring clues because then. Then it, you know, it becomes a bit tractable. Well, then you you could make things better, right? Once you start to get a sense of how it really works. Thank you so much for that, and thank you for gifting me one hundred questions for every question that you answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, also a constant process. I would love to give the floor to your questions as well, um, Ralph. Please, do can we have a mic, please? Thank you so much. We can't, cannot even give you yeah. oh, there is. hours. <laughs> uh, oh, there's yes. two. Let's start with Ralph, I'm sorry, but I promised. I saw you first. Uh, David, here's a question for you. Sure. Can you just give us in a short kind of explanatory way mm. what Better Than Money does and how it can be connected into the global financial system? Is this something that has to be woven into the International Monetary Fund? the Bank of Settlement. What I'm trying to sense sure. is you've come up with... What's the path to adoption? No, but even oh, more sorry. than that, you've what come up with better than money yes. of what this vehicle is. Right. What can the vehicle do over, a, say, the short term to mm -hmm. medium term? What is it that can be injected into the current global financial mm -hmm. system and which element of it would best be used to be its harbour? Well... You know, uh, like I said, I've spent a lot of time, uh, a friend of mine at Berkeley used to say, twirling with the, uh, the powers that be in the global financial system. Like I've been in those inner sanctums and those, you know, uh, studied all the, the, you know, the mechanisms, the plumbing of the global financial system, if you will. And, um, you know, uh, I think that... Actually, I'm sorry, but better than money doesn't really need to integrate. <laughs> it can just, it can basically overlay on. I mean, it so very concretely and, and you know, in a few words, I'll say that if a major uh, blockchain project emerged to do this or an existing you know, centralized blockchain exchange of the, of the first tier of which, you know, you know I mean, discussions, um, wanted to do this, it could be done in, in a matter of months. And that, because we already have the user software that's running on a smartphone app, you know, it looks really, we tested it, people like it, it's easy to use, it's really just an app, it's not like a whole trading desk, you know, it's very simple. And then it, it could be deployed for the unpermission, for the blockchain kind of assets globally from one day to the next because it, that's, it, you know, this is unpermissioned. Now, for, the, for assets like, uh, you know, equities and, you know, major markets and, and debt and, 
you know, all kinds of index things. So if you look at the you know, set of assets I'd like to see is basically BlackRock's 1100 ETFs. I mean, that's a nice set that you can really do all kinds of stuff with. Because don't forget, I'm not talking about people individually choosing the portfolio necessarily. You can get tips from AI about how to make your portfolio be way better than what your bank could have done a few years ago, but, and, and then, of course, way better for you. So uh, succinctly, commercial banks, regular banks, can issue this product to their customers directly if the customers have the app. So they just need, the banks need some back-end software. In other words, this would be a, what we call a Web 2 version. You wouldn't have the digital assets on your phone. They'd be in custody at your bank. But the bank can make it look like this is all working perfectly for you, and it, you'll have the same net effect. For the blockchain stuff, you, know, you may actually have a Web3 version where the, you have the keys and so on. But you, so anyway, so, so that would be on a per-bank basis, but, but it's easily replicable, and the, the, the app that people have could use both the, uh, you know, their bank's offering for the regulated portion of the assets portfolio and the unregulated portion that's available globally in a seamless way. So you wouldn't notice that as a user because no, no, no commercial bank wants to compete with the blockchain space to, you know, to deliver those kind of assets because they can't. Uh, they, so that they rely, they let the app work. Uh, yeah, so that's, is that, does that answer your question, Ralph? I, I, I hope, uh, it, I, mean, it, I mean, I'm saying no, <laughs> thanks for the question, but you know, normally you would think you'd have to get all these guys to change what they're doing and uh, that, you know, would be very difficult, but maybe achievable. I mean, but I'm saying, actually, and I never even thought about doing it that way. I just think we'll just just move. We just, it's a leapfrog thing. You know, you're going from a like a, you know, the the Gutenberg type of money to a very sophisticated multi-party computation cryptographic money that you know, like with AI mixed in. That's like you know. It, it's a big leap. So you always, when you introduce new technology, you know, there's a big technology uh, improvement. You know, you, you, you usually talk about it like leapfrogging, right? You, you just sort of leave the rest in the dust. You just move directly to it. And I mean, the amazing, uh, just, I mean, I know we have a few questions now, that's great. So, but so the amazing thing about cryptography it's so well suited to someone like me who creates all these things because you can build these structures and prove that they will work and, and it's all digital so it'll just keep working. It's not like you know you invent a new kind of plastic or glass and then have to build a plant first and test it and you won't really find out for years and all that. This is like, it's all digital and so you, you, you can uh, move very expeditiously and without any I really need to look back. So if you can, you know, if you can think of a practical cryptographic, we call it protocol. So right, that's what I'm. What I I do is is I take the building blocks of cryptography and I combine them with in a, with time into protocols, which are you know processes that take you know steps. This is a different way of thinking than mathematics, which is about you know sort of closed forms. It's a, it's a, it's, it takes a while to get into it, but when you do, it's, you start to see it's extraordinarily powerful, and we've been able to actually prove that. So, yeah, so we're, we're, it's a very powerful medium, but it's so reproducible and so provable and so uh, definite that, uh, you know, it lends itself to, to, to like immediate scalability. Now everyone has another 100 questions. No, right? but I think this should have more. Yeah, yeah, let's please start here. Hi there. Uh, my name is James Fierro. I'm with Eco Capacity Exchange. Um, and uh, look, uh, you know, ambitious project, and commend you for uh, devoting a big part of your life to uh, trying to improve the economic architecture of how the world recognizes and exchanges value. Um, you've been at it for 40 something years, uh, from what I can gather. 
Um, and I don't know if you. Well, have I'm any... not going to necessarily agree exactly with your characterization, but I'm I'm, I'm open to your question. Okay. Um, the um, so you've been at the idea of like. But you have a question, or you yeah, want to characterize what I'm doing incorrectly? Well, you can you characterize it. I don't want to. I okay. do, I'm asking you. Do you have a question or yeah, not? It's related to that. Background. Just ask the question. Okay. Um, you've been at it that long. Uh, how much longer does it? Take? I'm not going to respond to you. Let me to the next question, please. You're just character. I mean. Just trying to find ask out the question. What ask is the question. succession plan? How much longer is it going to take? Less than a year. That's all. And the succession plan. It's a business question. Well, there, so w the thing is, we have several avenues that we could go down. So there's whole countries. Did you come in a little bit? Whole countries. We have. Um, there's major funds. There's um, some of these major partners. You know, we have major actors in the financial services industry. Um, so there's a, like a number of ways uh, we could go. And I, I was real busy coming up with this. I haven't been working on it for 40 years, right? It's only in the last year. And I apologize for this. You know, it's like we say, light dawns a marble head, you know? It was only in the last year that I realized, my gosh, money is, is so important to, to, to the poor and their suffering because the money they have been given is such the wrong thing for them. And I really need to do something about it. And that was an open-ended epiphany. And I just started working on it without a real direction. And I just kept pushing and refining. And so uh, it's come together relatively quickly because, weirdly, I was able to draw on the stuff the Bank for International Settlement paid for <laughs> that was just made public uh, you know, a couple weeks ago. And... Um, a lot of the stuff I've been doing, that was based on my earlier work with eCash, so there's a lot of cumulative development and everything was just sort of in place. So I just sort of walked in and said, Here, this is kind of how to do it. And then I got a lot of great feedback from people, you know, and I was inspired by other uh, scientists. There's a nuclear scientist who has written about, you know, very concerned with liquidity crisis and he's uh, been helping me with this project and... Uh, you know, I had the opportunity to speak to a lot of uh, leading economists and head of research at the Fed and, uh, you know, all kinds of people. And uh, so, I, you know, it takes a village. But, this is incredible. Uh, yeah. like so, so, so many different backgrounds who are... Yeah, I mean, he, 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 I got, you know, so when, when I was keeping it under wraps, I was still getting, uh, I was seeking out, you know, I was hoping someone would say, oh, David, this is, mm -hmm. you know, economists already figured this out years ago or we're already... You know, you know, no, it was, I kept trying to find someone to say they could find it in, in the literature or something. No, it's, this is a fresh idea. And so I'm on the hook for uh, having to do it. Let's hear the questions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Here and then. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for your reference to Kuhn. It helped me understand oh, yeah. what you were talking about as a paradigm shift, which is what you're saying. Is yes. that what you're saying better than money is? It, it, it definitely is a paradigm shift. I was also trying to say that, you know, when I read Kuhn, and I was a student at Berkeley, and I used, a lot of, one of the famous electronic money results was created 10 meters from where Kuhn wrote that book. He wrote it at the forum, and, and we did a, there's a, 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 Fiat and Noor, my co-authors on, on offline electronic cash, we sat at the Cafe Med, which was next, next door. Yeah, go ahead, sorry, funny so, thing. My question is really elementary. So. You, you have this uh, digital currency. What, what is it backed by? It, assets that are freely contributed? And it, okay, so it's not, a, okay, it's not a super currency. It, but, so, you know, it's not a currency of currencies. The structure imitates that of fractional reserve banking. So there is kind of a central entity which can be replicated, but in the simplest case, it's central, single entity, where the the asset pro each asset provider has to have like a reserve account at the central entity, if you will, in, in what might appear to be a super currency. But it never actually is uh, taken by the it's just you it's a we call it a liquidity buffer, it's locked and unlocked, so that the central entity can give finality to the transaction. To the, from the payer. So as a user, you think it works, it's instant, and it always lock guarantees me payment because I only talk to this one entity. Even though there's 1,100 assets and some of them are slow and their computer's broken or whatever, it doesn't matter. It always looks like it's working perfectly fast because you only have to talk 
to the central entity, which then locks the transaction, guaranteeing finality, irreversibility, the counterparty doesn't receive necessarily good funds or the ability to unspend the value instantly, but they could, depending on the asset providers that they've chosen. So some of them may be very you know, quick, and others may be slower. That's up to them, if it makes sense. So. Um, Does it answer your question? Yeah, very scalable in that sense. Thank you. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you. First here, and then here. Thanks, David. Absolutely fascinating. Professor Lisa Wilson. Um, I do a lot of work in uh, emerging nations and obviously in carbon markets at the moment, um, particularly around Africa. My professorship, professor, professor, get it right, professorship is actually from South Africa, mm. um, and it's not a uh, not academic based; it's actually industry based. But um, I'm actually hearing that this would actually be a profound impact for the nations of Africa yes. and carbon markets. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because I just think this is just fascinating. Yeah, so I, th to be quite frank, I mean, I am, obviously Africa is the most, and Indonesia are the world place, Mexico maybe, places where we're going to see the most uh, fundamental growth because of the demographics and research, all these factors. And, and uh, you know, we're starting to see already some real movement in, in some countries. And uh, ironically, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, we're talking about, is, from what you read, potentially the biggest victim of global warming, right? This will, it will cause death in, in a, a large portion of sub-Saharan Africa because of the subsistence farming and the weather patterns and so on. So it's a life and death matter. That's where you find the most activism, really, because it's... And um, so better than money can help, you know, developing countries participate globally on equal on a level playing field, and and involve their populations in part, you know really participating in the global investment scene, uh, and, and that will help the global investment scene. And from you know what I understand, it's really um, you, you know it's it's very popular in Africa in these emerging economies to be investing in things, and and and, the bank, and so and I think people sense that this is the way. Uh, you know, to, to, to really move things forward. So, yes, uh, however, um, I'm not sure that I am a fan of carbon credits, and that's not because of the problems we've seen. You know, uh, I was working on carbon credits and using eCash for them in the 1990s if you can believe it, with a guy named Arndt Weber. He's a, a German uh, uh, scientist entrepreneur, and we were scheming up these carbon markets and how we would use eCash and, and all. I mean, I, I get it, but I, I am a bigger fan of AstroCool. Uh, I do think... Now, you know, go ahead, shoot me, but I think that this there's a lot of... Well, I don't think it's necessarily disingenuous, but it is. Uh, there isn't that that much openness to a way to really solve these climate problems fundamentally. Uh, more or less, there's more of a feeding frenzy on all the benefits. You know, the R and R travel. You know, and you know, investors gather together and say, "Well, we've got you know trillions of dollars of assets under management. We're not going to." let poor countries, you know, benefit, get more energy. You know, uh, I really, I, I think there's something wrong with this picture. If, if people should look a little bit at how we could just solve the problem, just cool the planet back down until we have the technology and the fusion and all that to do, you know, to take the carbon out and so on and, we can, you know, and all that. So I'm sorry for, for I don't want to, you know, I mean, I got enough things to... <laughs> To battle with, but that's I have to say because the AstroCool, you know, it it's 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 a uh, you know it's a it's a clean kill. We, I mean, there's other metaphors I could use, but it's a it's a way to uh, just solve the. It basically gives us a global thermostat, and if you're against that and you'd rather see a lot of people really suffer economically or uh, you know uh, or die because nothing is done then I can't really support that position. I think, for, 
but it's not a tech fix, but if, if we can create a global thermostat so we can keep the planet cool until we figure out how to live here without like heating it up, um, and we don't do that, we do some other stuff because we claim that we can't do that, that's, that is morally uh, bankrupt. That's a very bad thing. So I think it's incumbent upon us to at least put a fraction of the energy and attention, I mean, I mean metaphorically, the effort uh, that we're putting into all these, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of mediations and, 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 and markets and so on into, hey, is there a way just to, you know, slow this process down to stop it so we can, you know, uh, get on with trying to make the world a paradise again? I like the way you moved from euphemism to, like, straightforwardness. <laughs> here, please. Hi. Hey. David. Um, Nadim here. I have a question and maybe then a statement, if that's okay. All right. Uh, For you, Eugene, you can make a statement. Just don't make it about me. No, <laughs> make it about gonna, something else. Uh, That'll be good. Christina previously um, asked you, what is it, or in other words, what are you waiting for to make better than money a reality? And you've said a lot around the topic, mm -hmm. but there was no direct answer. Like, what is missing? Is it people? Is it a company? Is it an institution? Is it a guy or a girl? What is it? Well, uh, I characterize, thanks for, for, you know, let me try to be more direct. I think that in principle, there's sort of three potential obstacles to better than money, right? One of them would be uh, that it's really hard to get the legal uh, and other structures to have effective custody of assets. But I think that ETF, you know, it's a $10 trillion dollar it's 10% of global assets under management. It's a done deal, right? That's not a question. You grew like this. I, interestingly, I want to give credit to Larry Fink, who you know, had the idea that ETF could give the common man the ability to you know, invest like the rich guys. And uh, you know, this, what I'm doing is just a continuation of that. It's the next, taking it just to, to the next level. Um, so uh, so that's, you know, that's that kind of legal technical aspect. Then there's the technology aspect. Well, that's the Bank for National, the Turbulon Project report shows it's, it's, it's crazy, but the technology that you would use to make a CBDC is exactly the same technology you need to make a you know, platinum, uh, what we call, I call a provider within uh, better than money. In other words, for, the, for each particular asset has to issue a digital token, but the way it do, would do that would be using the, uh, the CBDC as if it were the central bank of platinum. And that, so that technology has been built, tested. I bought the T-shirt with the app. I saw the, the back end work. They, they rigorously tested it. It worked three times faster than it need, needed to. And of course, it could be scaled further. So um, that part's had done done. Done, done, done. And the third part is the, uh, you know, business mojo to make it happen. And there's, there are, you know, there are people, there are, look, I mean, look at uh, Alipay, PayPal, Visa International, MasterCard, the hungry number two, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of options. There's a, look at the first tier, Exchanges, uh, you know, centralized exchanges of in the in the in the in, in our space. I think you're one of the blockchain people. I judge by the by your uh, your garments. Um, so uh, <laughs> you know, you know. So, uh, but looks could be deceiving. So um, uh, yeah. So I think those are the three components. And so that third one, you know, there is no. I, I don't have. If I if I had an ink deal, I'd be at a, this would be a press conference. Uh, but I was busy figuring this all out, and now I'm talking to a lot of people. There's a lot of interest. You know, I ask people, are you are they interested? They say, Are you kidding? And I'm thinking, hmm, maybe they're not interested. They say, Of course I'm interested. So this is the, this is the reaction I'm getting. I'm not getting, you know, uh, people saying, Well, that's nice, but we're gonna you know watch out. We're gonna block you or something. No, it's like people are. Uh, excited about it across the board, and 
you know, uh, I'm in a lucky position that I have ownership of the global patent portfolios for the underlying technology, CBDC with privacy, and now this, and the user interface even. So, uh, but, you know, that I've always believed in patents because if you want to get a lot of mojo behind something, then you have the patents, and that's, that's, that can help you do it. So I'm, I'm talking to people, and I'm getting on a plane and going to talk to another, you know, country, uh, and then, you know, there's, there's real national interest. And, uh, you know, it, 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 unfortunately, blockchain, as you know, in our, our space is not well understood by the top people generally in most, uh, you know, uh, structures. Uh, but they have people. And so you have to kind of, you know, educate those people. And they have, so it, it's a little bit time consuming, but, um, you know, when you have a competitive situation, of course, that can expedite things, and that's what... I mean, I, because I personally feel we have to get going on this, because the liquid, global liquidity crisis, big, big problem. That could just wipe things out for a few years, and I re, if, if I can do something to avoid, help avoid that, you know, I'm, I, I, it's inexcusable for me to you know, go on vacation or something. So I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make it happen, and if it's not the optimal way, but it, it's... Ex expedient and it will, you know, uh, have a high certainty of being able to to move forward, then um, I'll go with that. That's kind of the, yeah, so that's kind of the situation. Does it answer your question? It does indeed. Can I go with my statement now? Ah, it wasn't a statement. <laughs> yeah, I didn't but, say it yet. So my statement is I've been working on something relatively very similar. Oh, good. For the past four years. Wow. And all I need is a person like you. And that's it. And, that's a and, great and statement. I, I, have the, I have the key to the golden door. Oh, okay. Yeah. So cool. If you want to take it on, you said you said earlier you only met enthusiasts. Yeah. I'm not an enthusiast. I'm a doer, <laughs> executor, real one. So. Okay, great. Let's talk to us. Join us for our lunch. We're having a little Capital lunch. Capital Club connections. Amazing. Yeah. Very last question, if we have one, or we can continue. Networking, talking, exchanging contacts, seeing money in better than money and impact in uh, better than us, right? Right. <laughs> better version of us. David, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's the morning, but my brain feels like, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I think uh, you cannot send more than one conversation like this per day just because this is so inspiring and energetic. Thank you. And you are a person who really, who move. Uh, and I really wish you to move um, both with ideas and also with, uh, you know, diplomatic um, shifts that will help you to move forward and... Uh, to bridge the unbridgeable and um, to move forward with all the communities that need to be involved yes. and uh, need to commit. Thank you very much yeah. for, for everyone for being here. And thank you again, uh, David and Capital Club and uh, COP28 for bringing us all together. Thank you so much. Big round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Thank thank you. very insightful, amazing conversation. And, uh, Thank you once again, uh, David, John, and uh, Christina for, for this, you, and Summer. Capital Club, and, uh, and uh, uh, M uh, MCH. So uh, appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.